Hello and welcome back. This is Ryder Richards. This is Let Us Think About It. If you've enjoyed the string of interviews lately, well, cool. Uh, I sort of gave those as a gift to myself for keeping the podcast going for a year. Uh, They do a couple of things. One is it really opens up the conversation a bit. And part two, I was getting a bit wiped out. Uh, This is really kind of a second full-time job to keep the podcast running, which is shocking to me. I didn't uh, assume that when I jumped into it. But during the lockdown, the time was easy enough to find. But now, of course, I'm beginning the really hard work of making time when I have other priorities like family and friends, and of course, there's the outdoors beckoning. Yeah, as if I'm a woodsman or something. I I do like to work wood, but... Oh, wait. Uh, Anyway, this week, we're going to tackle some Baudrillard. He's one of those philosophers or thinkers you can hear a lot about in art school. He's kind of like Freud or Jung or Walter Benjamin. Uh, You're going to hear them cited a lot in art circles. But does anyone really know what they're talking about there? Or are they just simulating being smart? Are they just stealing words like simulacrum and death drive to really just sort of simulate intelligence? I mean, is the whole premise of art just fakery? I don't know. But I'm going to have a friend, a buddy of mine named Luke, uh, come on the show and we're going to talk about some of these things. Uh, but for Baudrillard and Benjamin, both of them discuss reproduction. No. Not the kind of reproduction Freud is obsessed with, but more about the mass reproduction from the industrial age. And if you're really a ceramicist in art and you're making molds and you're cranking out, say, 20 or 100 of the same object, well, there kind of needs to be a conversation about what happens when you go from the one original thing to a mass of identical similar things. So if it's one vase and it's beautiful, well, it's sublime. It's art. But all of a sudden, if you make a hundred identical vases and you put them all together, is it sublime anymore? I don't, maybe it's just product now. What happens to it? So we run into this very kind of sticky situation in the art world where we have to start talking about things like difference and repetition. Does repetition without difference diminish something? Or does it somehow make it more potent through its standardization? Like, these are really fun questions to dig into. Now, in Benjamin, he has this book or this text called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In there, he talks a lot about the aura of the object, and you can think of that like the soul or something like that. So does a handmade thing have more aura or soul than if you make a 100 things? I mean, what happens if you make a 100 of the same vase? Do you split up the aura so each vase gets one one one-hundredth of the vitality of the original? And why, I mean, as consumers, do we crave the homogenized uniform teacup or the tea kettle? This thing without character or history or flaws, and they all look identical. Well, of course, the thing does have character and history and flaws, but somehow they seem diminished. Or maybe they're even just less forgivable. Maybe these flaws are not endearing when they come out of a factory, rather than being made by hand. So what happens there, right, is our relationship to the object changes upon how the object is produced and how many of them there are, how standardized they are, so difference in repetition. But anyway, let's save some of that conversation for Luke whenever I get him onto the podcast and we can kind of dig through uh, Benjamin and Baudrillard and move that into maybe the current state of the art world. But for Baudrillard, who really discusses all this in a slightly different way, what we're going to get is kind of a mirror and a map for how the whole world is proceeding since antiquity and industrial era right up into the postmodern age. So what I want to do here is really map out some of the Wikipedia-type knowledge about Baudrillard's philosophy, and also it will help us get accustomed to his language and the way he thinks and puts ideas together. So next week, I think what we're going to do is skip over some of the simulacre and simulation stuff, and we're going to jump into the transparency of evil stuff, where he has an essay in there called After the Orgy, and I'm kind of going to try to do a deep dive, like really get into the text on that next week. Uh, And perhaps, here's the thing, you might agree or disagree with his ideas, but what I really like is that he's playing with radical thoughts, and this was happening 40 years ago, and yet when I look around today, I don't see a whole lot of stuff that's more modern or contemporary than what he was talking about back then. And we might actually realize that indeed, the territory no longer precedes the map, nor does it survive it. The basics. 
If you look up Baudrillard on Wikipedia, which I'm that kind of guy, uh, well, you get lists of things. There's four stages of this, and three degrees of that, and five phenomenon, and shuffle to the right, and lean, and dab, and... I mean, it starts to look like dance steps, or a playbook, or something. And of course, while lists are super handy, this also falls exactly into the kind of traps that Baudrillard warns against, of really trying to create a map out of a very vibrant text. And in so doing, you reduce it to a model, and this is kind of a slim, tight abstraction and we tend to do this with all things. So his language and his writing, it's its really quite great. I really love reading his stuff. It's so much better than a lot of the older philosophers that I read from centuries ago. But really, like for an example, how many philosophers say things like this? A thing which has lost its idea is like the man who has lost his shadow. It must either fall under the sway of madness or perish. Um, or who uses phrases like, the desert of the real itself. Wait, hang on a second. That last one, that desert of the Welcome real thing, I've heard that before, to the right? desert. Yeah, that's the Matrix. Of mm, the real. I know. Did he steal that from the Matrix? Well, no, the Matrix stole it from him. And apparently people say that uh, it's really based on Baudrillard, the Matrix is. But really, this is uh, it's a mashup of several things, right? And the, the whole plot line is a little bit more like Plato's kind of shadow puppet cave allegory with some cyberpunk mixed in. And it's a little bit more like Nozick's brain tank, right? Where you're living in a simulated reality and you have these kind of dream states and then you have to ask what's real. If you lived in a dream, would you want to wake up if the truth was more painful? And then we get into these other things like what is the actual value of the real or radical authenticity. There are aspects of the Matrix that do sort of fit in with Baudrillard's stuff though. Um, for instance, like this Agent Smith idea is this kind of immunological virus or agent that uh, is actually protecting the simulation. That shows up in some of his other texts later about us protecting our own simulations. And that all kind of, of course, smacks of Baudrillard. And he even says things like, the Neo-Real. And I'm just like, oh, Neo, got it, right? And so I keep doing the reference thing. but. The movie also sort of misses some key aspects of how you would want to represent Baudrillard's conception of the simulacrum. Writer, you keep saying simulacrum. What the hell does that mean? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I had to look it up again because I tend to forget or I tend to think somebody's using it wrong and I need to go back and dig. So what is it? So if you simulate a thing, an idea, an image, there are steps to it. There's a process that it goes through. And Baudrillard kind of maps those out for us. And maybe the easiest way to think of it is, if I photograph something really profoundly beautiful, maybe like a puppy taking a poop, uh, well, and then I pull that up on my big computer screen and I photograph that screen and I just keep doing this process over and over again, copy of a copy of a copy, until all of a sudden I end up with just this blurry mess. Well. I've kind of produced a simulacrum, sort of. Well, in its final stage, it no longer has a relationship to the original moment of delight, you know, with the uh, puppy pooping. So, of course, if this is philosophy, so nothing is that simple. It's all much more complicated than that. Uh, and Baudrillard sort of maps out these four phases that a simulation runs through to get to the simulacrum. And so one would be... The simulation starts and there's a reflection of this profound reality. You're actually found something profound and you're trying to sort of simulate it. And then at some point though, the second stage is that it kind of masks and denatures or waters down this profound reality. And then the third stage is it masks the absence of the profound reality. We've actually gotten away from having this profound reality because we're simulating it. And then by the fourth stage, we don't even know what the profound reality is. There's no relation to it at all anymore. This thing, this simulation, is now running on its own as a pure simulacrum. So that's when it becomes a simulacrum, is when it's just operating on its own with no reference to the profound reality that it maybe originally started from. We wouldn't even know anymore. So, like, if you try to think of movies, something like, what about the Fast and Furious franchise? At what point does that become a simulacra of itself? Well, since it was never really profound to begin with, or even real for that matter, then it kind of lends itself to parody until it becomes untethered completely from whatever values the original might have possessed that were stimulating, right? But this isn't really what we're getting into here, because what we should be looking at is Hollywood. Hollywood is a fake town making fake stories, and in so doing, they're masking and watering down reality. 
they're actually masking the larger absence that there's nothing profound under reality. And that larger absence might be that Hollywood itself has no profound reality. And then if you back out another step, Hollywood exists in LA, exists in California, exists in the United States, and we no longer even need this idea of a mask anymore because there is no profundity within this system. The entire system, including our wars, are all a simulacrum. It isn't that they aren't real, and this is an important point. They are real. They're very much real. They have real-world results and impacts. But the motivating force behind them has been simulated so many times over that it's lost its relationship to the very profound reality that originally motivated it. It has lost its relationship to the sacred. And now all we have are drifting abstractions and slogans. It's become untethered. It's become divorced from purpose. And now it's free to create its own purpose. And oftentimes that just ends up as theatricality. So Baudrillard discusses Disneyland in this way. The childish unreal amusement park is actually Los Angeles, right? And to mask that childishness, we created an even more fake world, Disneyland, obviously fake, right? In the middle of LA. So we masked our distance from the profound reality with a simulation. But Baudrillard would say that this simulation, or simulacrum, it isn't actually a mask hiding profound reality. Disneyland is the truth. Adults are children. All of LA is grown-ups playing in a simulation. And upon arriving at Disneyland, they actually get to be real children instead of pretending anymore. Now, what all this really conceals is that there is no truth. Uh, the simulacra preceded the truth. Well, that's weird, right? We never actually got to see the profound reality because the simulacra was moving ahead of us. So this reality, this abyss, this is the dark void from which we're running, right? Um, whenever Lawrence Fishburne shows up and says red or blue pill, like we're slapping that red pill out of his hand, right? And we're diving straight back into the simulation as fast as possible rather than sort of staring into that dark abyss. Now, if the simulacrum, again, this is the simulation that over time has lost all relation to reality and now just kind of runs itself. If this is the truth, if the simulacrum is our truth, if it shows up before reality, well, geez, that's like scary as hell, right? This untethered model, it's really just an abstraction that's running out there. It's a map and it's laying out a path in front of us but it has forgotten the territory. It has no reference to the land below. So this is like the Borges fable, right? If you make an accurate map to the exact size and scale of the world, a one-to-one -one ratio, then you can lay that entire map over the world like a blanket. Well, then at what point do you forget that the world beneath actually exists and you only rely on the abstraction of the map? In this abstract realm, in this false simplified model, that gets further and further abstracted from the source, we now move without any real reference anymore. So this is just straight up momentum, and we are theatrically simulating drama while pretending to be real. And we actually mistake it for being real because it happens to be on our map, and it's the only reference we have. Now, simulations, that's what they do, right? They make illusions so believable that we forget or we never question. A really good simulation does that. We lose ourselves to them believing the legend of the map. And without reference, without ideals to anchor the decisions that we make, we move beyond good and evil. We move beyond truth. All of a sudden, truth and secrecy are equivalent. So there are actually now conspiracies to cover up that there is no conspiracy. This is all just sort of running in loops. Any event that now happens is both a simulation and a truth at the same time, and this plays into the simulation. And rebelling against the simulation? Ah, man, that equally all occurs within the simulation, and it only grants it greater legitimacy because of the drama and theatricality and because of the actual emotion pumped into it, which tends to make it just more real rather than grounding it in the really real. Confusing, right? So Disneyland, at this point, it's equally as real as LA, perhaps more real. And we actually teach our kids the values of artifice through Disneyland as stand-ins for maybe the real values we should have. And here's the thing is we've been doing this so long, we don't even know what the real values are anymore. I don't know. I would just list off a litany of maybe biblical values or something. I, I honestly don't know what other options I would have. So when you kind of look around, you see people running 
And these people don't have a shadow anymore. They have become detached from the really real, right? This sort of sacred, profound connections that originally motivated people. So what we see is speed, frantic anxiety, depression. And we really have these two major concerns that seem to be mapping out the way our world functions right now. This is the individualization of, quote, rational actors, right? These individuals finding themselves through their consumptive experience and escapism. And then we also have this insatiable hunger for money, which can never really be fulfilled. This is a perpetual hedonistic desire. Now, money is, as Baudrillard says, perhaps the first abstraction of values of this profound reality, the first simulation. And this is something that motivated people. And at some point, capital, money in general, escaped the orbit of needing to reference a profound reality. It becomes a simulacrum. It is now trans economics. It's beyond and transcendent. It is out of reach. It is beyond morality. So I'm reading another book right now. It's Charles Eisenstein's um, Sacred Economics. And if the original purpose of money was kind of as a token of gratitude for a gift, and even if barter and exchange came much later, that maybe wasn't even the beginning of money, then how can we recenter? How can we reground economics back into the spirit of gratitude and an ecosystem of social interchange? I don't know yet, right? I'm reading the book as we go, but maybe we can figure it out. Maybe we can have some ideas of where we can go in the future. Obviously, we can't go backwards, but there might be a path ahead. So this week, we mapped out some ideas, gave you some concepts, uh, maybe slightly different terminology that can be used. And of course, next week, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper by looking at one essay. It's called After the Origin. It's from the Transparency of Evil texts uh, by Baudrillard. And we're going to try to explain more precisely the chain of logic since modernity, where the truth and secrecy, or good and evil, become equivalent, or how these things proliferate outwards into these trans versions where an idea enters an orbit and it expands, right? Where these kind of things happen. Should be a fun essay, but it's also going to be a bit deeper of a dive, and hopefully we can get a a little bit more structured about it. But until next time, once again, if you enjoy the show, like, rate, review, all those good things, uh, sign up for a membership online. Take care. All the best.